Hello, Mike Simmons. How you doing? Good. My name's Dan Roshan. I'm here with Mike Simmons, and today we're going to have a conversation about how to go from zero to a million bucks in 12 months <laughs> in uh, real estate. So, Mike, tell us a little bit about, about you. Tell us a little bit about, about where you come from. And I know you're in Detroit, or at least uh, north of Detroit, about yep. 30 minutes north of Detroit. And yep. I know that you got in real estate around 2008. Yep. And so what caused you to want to get into real estate? Yeah. And I will say too, you mentioned zero to, to a million in 12 months. That's one of those eight, eight to nine year overnight success stories. <laughs> so it took a lot of learning to get there. But I'm, I'm like you said, I'm from Michigan, uh, born and raised. So Midwest guy, parents, automotive workers, kind of real straight shooters, kind of union oriented, you know, work your butt off until you're 65 or 70, or you can't physically work anymore. That's sort of the mentality I came from. No entrepreneurs in my, in my life. So growing up, I kind of geared myself toward that, like get a job, hopefully with a union benefits, job for life, total security. You know what I mean? All those things that we kind of were taught when I was younger back in the 80s. And um, and I went down that route and, and I got a job and I got a job at a union to right out of high school. So I thought I'm good to go, man. I was working at UPS, never need to go anywhere else. Solid company, Teamsters Union. My parents were happy just totally wrecked my back. By the time I was 24, I couldn't get out of bed without the help of a, a chiropractor appointment about three or four times a week at, at 24. And I, I just I, I just read the tea leaves and said, I can't do this the rest of my life. I'll, I'll was, this, was this in Detroit? Yeah, in Detroit. Yep. Okay. Yep. So so not not good for me. Started kind of reinvented myself, went into the automotive industry, which is obviously what a lot of people do around here. And got my degree. I went back to college, got my degree because once I got into UPS, I'm like, man, I don't even need school. Like I'm golden <laughs> here, you know. Um, but I, you, I that so you were out. making you were making some money there at UPS. Then. Yeah, yeah, I was doing really well actually yeah. at the time. Um, yeah. You know, I think I think the wage back in 1980, 1990 when I when I got there, I was there in eighty eight, but I, I worked part time for a while loading trucks, which is how I hurt my back, by the way. But uh, by the time I was driving, it was like 23, 24, 25 dollars an hour, like back in 90. That's oh, that's great money. Yeah, yeah, you know, a lot of overtime if you want it. So it was good. Um, but it just didn't work out physically. I, I saw the other people who had been there for 10, 15, 20, 25 years, and they were on medical leave half the year. Like they, they, they were stooped over their arms and legs and shoulders and joints were all destroyed. And I just didn't, I knew I didn't want that obviously. Okay. So when I went in the automotive industry, went back to college, right now, I think I might need college and really put myself on the track that I wanted to be on, which was college degree, start off, you know, working in a, in a factory kind of environment or a shop environment and work your way up to white collar kind of in a management and go that route. And I did it. And I got my degree. I doubled my income. I was on this track that I wanted to be on. But I saw the people who occupied the jobs and the positions that I was vying for down the road. And they were all miserable. They were all unhappy. They hated their wives. They hated their lives. They hated their kids. They hated everything about their life. They were just miserable. And they were married to the job. And you know, I just thought, geez, this cannot be what I'm trying to strive for. Like, that's not the future I want. So looked at investing, you know, just figuring what am I going to do with the money I have? Like, how, how do I retire sometime earlier than maybe what the, the company would allow me to if I just kind of just kept living paycheck to paycheck and um, and stocks and the stock market. Right. So it's just it's just intuitively. That's what my mind went to. Go ahead. I, if I'm how, how old were you at this time? Uh, at this time, I was 30. Three, 30, 32, 33. Okay, so 24, your back gives out on you. You decide to go from UPS to finishing school. Yep. And then 24 to 33, during that time period, you're in college, sort of, during that I, period? I was, I, I was in college toward the end of that and okay. kind of on that track where I realized, oof, this isn't the right path. Okay, so now you're 33 and you're still in college and you're looking at, okay, the, the what I'm aspiring to do doesn't, it doesn't excite me. Okay. Yep, All right. Exactly. So got gotcha. you. I just want to make sure that we're tracking here. <laughs> yeah, totally. And so around that time, I was looking at, you know, stocks and stock market and trying to learn that whole world. And I just hated it. Like I could get into stories about how much I hated it. I hated it. It wasn't for me. It was, it was like reading insurance manuals, which no, nothing against insurance folks. It's great. We need it. It's not for me. It bored me. So, uh, but if you Google investing and in investment vehicles and how do I invest for retirement? What are the best investment types? You eventually hit real estate. So real estate hit my radar at that point, right? 33 years old. Okay. Now what happened between 33 and 38 for me, which is, uh, I was born in 1970. So 33 was 2003, 2008. Between those years, it was a lot of me, what I call getting ready to get ready. Paralysis analysis. 
let's just call it what it is. It was fear. I was afraid. So I was afraid what, were you do, what were you doing when you were paralyzed at, uh, during that? I was still fight. working at the corporate automotive job. Got it. Okay. Yep. So then 2008, what happens then? 2000. So between 2003, 2008, a lot of, a lot of soul searching, a lot of wanting something. Yeah. A lot of people can probably identify with this because we all do it in some way. So whether it be losing weight, getting a degree, getting a better job, finding a girl, finding a guy, whatever it is, we think about it. We fantasize about what it'll be like. We want it and, and we don't do anything. There's no action. There's no execution. And that's what I was doing for those years. So what happened in 2008 was to be perfectly honest with you, I got disgusted with myself. I got disgusted with the fact that I wasn't I had to be honest with myself. Like I was going to like meetups and RIAs and talking to real estate professionals. And like I was immersed in the world mentally, but I wasn't actually doing anything. It was almost like I was in a, in a virtual reality where everyone around me was doing what I wanted to do. And I sort of felt like by being around it all the time, I was, you know, I was in the pool, I was getting wet, but I wasn't swimming for sure. So, so I got discussed with myself. And just to kind of give you a little context and back up a little bit. I grew up in a family where it was automotive. It was hardworking. My my father was a, a Vietnam vet, uh, volunteered to go to war. He was a, a Marine and he came home and he was a tool and die worker, biker guy, like just hard nosed. And, and there was just no room for fear or procrastination or excuses in my family growing up. And, and then when I got older, right, I wanted to do this thing and I just felt it. I was procrastinating. I was making excuses. And bottom line, I was afraid. And my dad's voice got in my head and just kind of, it just, it, it was enough to shake me out of my haze of fear and just start making offers. What right? was it? What did the voice say to you? <laughs> I don't know if I can repeat what my dad would say to me when I was afraid. <laughs> so say, it, say, it. What's yeah. the PG version of what the PG version is suck it up and go do it. Right. So I had to at some point I had to realize I needed to just suck it up and, and just close my eyes and, and, and not literally, but figuratively close my eyes and just jump. Start start doing it. Start making offers, because I know just from reading books and going to seminars, everyone would say you're not an investor. You're not a you're not a professional. You're not an agent until you get that first deal until you get that first property. So I had to come to terms with the fact that I wasn't taking the action that would ever get me to my goal. It was all mental stuff, right? Okay. Like I don't want to I don't want to bag on the secret, but it's sort of that if you if you think about it and, and you'll manifest it. Well, I, I think there's a component there that sometimes gets lost in the shuffle. And that's you have to take action. You have to yeah. do something. You know, right? Sitting at home and wanting something won't get it for you. So yeah, it's the secret uh, plus action. The secret plus action. Sure. Yeah. In visualization, I'm I'm not putting that down. That's a, that's a, that's a key component to success, but there has to be something behind it. And I, I went out and started making offers. And w once I did my first deal, I, I was off and running. I was, I was hooked. I, you know, sometimes you, people need to see something to believe it. And I don't know that I'm necessarily that, but back then I was, I don't know if I am so much anymore because now I'm, I'm absolutely fearless when it comes to taking risks, I, you know, physical risk, maybe not as much, I'm not into skydiving. I don't know that that would be something I'd want to do. But you put a, a business risk in front of me that I can calculate my odds of success, and I'm going to go for it most times. If I think there's a good chance of success, I'm going for it. So I don't I don't back down to that kind of stuff. And once I did, I, I was sort of off and running. But like I kind of teased in the beginning that zero to a million or or very little to a million, it was like in 12 months. But it was six years into my into my my business, six years into my journey because for six years. I just sort of bumbled around, tried to figure it out. I was running around, trying to do everything myself. And for a while, I was doing it while I had a job, right? Okay. Again, yeah. Let me, let me understand this. So around five years or so, you were preparing to take action. Yep. And then, so now we're in 2008? Yeah. Okay. So then in 2008, what did you do at that point? You took some sort of action. Yep. Specifically, what was that action you took? So for me, I started off flipping houses. So for okay. me, the action was uh, getting on the MLS or technically I found a realtor who would would work with me, who would get with okay. me and, and help me and started making offers on, on undervalued properties and foreclosures. And back then foreclosures, short sales and all these things, you know, it's very easy to find houses with potential equity or that were flippable back in 2008 because everyone, you know, prices were crashing. Everyone was jumping out of their house. And, and you're in Detroit, them. right? One of the top five yeah. devastated city or areas in the, in the country. Yeah, we, we got decimated. And, and really the, the the city of Detroit got decimated, but all the suburbs obviously did too. It's, you know, there was a, there, a lot of that was all tied together. I, I don't really invest in the city per se okay. because it's just 
unnecessary. I'm in the suburbs, but um, yeah, we experienced the same thing. Houses that were, you know, a couple of years earlier, we're going for, and this is Michigan numbers. So if you're in somewhere where the house prices are higher, you have to adjust, obviously. But in a blue collar, you know, three bedroom brick ranch, here we have basements. So with a basement, you know, just your standard house, nothing fancy, blue collar neighborhood. Um, that house would go for 130 to 150, just a real median house price. Um, then in 2008 and 2009, it, it, those houses were being sold for thirty, forty thousand dollars, so and like you could put seventy percent, like seventy percent off. Basically. Oh yeah, it was just it was a fire sale, and and they were all over the place. So okay. finding them on the MLS was was no big deal. It was fish in a barrel. It was just how many, how much that back then it was how much money do you have right. to, to to purchase and renovate or purchase and hold or whatever you're going to do. That that was sort of the deal back then. All right. So what was your first deal? My first deal was exactly what I described. It was a three bedroom brick ranch with a basement and a detached garage, which is just bread and butter around here. Um, I bought it for $40,000. So it's exactly that model. Now, the interesting thing was, you know, when it comes to procrastination and things like making a little bit of, of lemonade out of lemons, the first house that I technically got under contract and had an accepted offer for, offer for and was waiting to close on, I did it six months earlier. So it was like late 2007. And put an offer in, got accepted, $80,000, brick ranch, basement, three bedrooms, the whole nine. And while I was waiting to close, as most people watching this probably know, and remember, small banks, small mortgage companies, independent local things were just going out of business like crazy. So the, the mortgage company that I was going to close with went out of business while I was waiting wow. to close. And it just, the whole thing fell apart. I, lo I lost my, my EMD and you know I was like devastated. It was $2,000. And I was like, I don't even have... I mean, I had it, but I didn't have it to lose for sure. And uh, devastated. So kind of so went into a shelf. Was that a blessing looking back on it? Well, looking back, it was because yeah. that house that I bought or was going to buy for $80,000, yeah. six, seven months later, in the same neighborhood, the same subdivision, I bought the house for $40,000. So honestly, I would have lost money. I would have lost probably a lot of money had I yeah. got that house and then tried to sell it six, seven months later. Well, you would have done a short sale or would have got it for a yeah. yeah, exactly. And then back then, I didn't even know what a short sale was. Like sure. this was my first deal. I was sort of clueless about that stuff. Okay. So, so I got the house under contract for $40,000. I recently wrote the book, Real Estate Evolution, The 10-Step Guide to CPI, Consistent and predictable income for real estate agents. I wrote this book because I have sold real estate since 2007 and developed an immense amount of experience and knowledge. During my journey, I've witnessed hundreds and maybe even thousands of real estate agents fail in this business. And I firmly believe that that's a shame. In Real Estate Evolution, I will show you the exact steps that I have used as a real estate salesperson to sell one to 15 homes every single month for the past 129 consecutive months. It took me more than two decades to learn the sales and persuasion techniques and more than one decade to master the real estate sales techniques to be able to produce the content that makes up this book. And it took me more than a year to write at a pace of three hours every single day. If you're a real estate agent and you're looking for consistent and predictable income in your business, I invite you to get the book, Real Estate Evolution. And you can get that by visiting www therealestateevolution.com and I'll even give it to you for free as long as you pay for the postage. Made a lot of mistakes hiring contractors. Uh, well, I hired a guy. Before, how'd you get the 40 grand? You got financing for that? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I did. I went and got traditional financing, but I went with a bigger broker, a bigger okay. mortgage company that I knew okay. had more stability. And for the renovation, we were all in on our own personal money, whether it's savings and credit cards and you know, we had a credit card that had a $20,000 limit. We had about five or $6,000 saved. So we just sort of put all that in. We only needed 15, but we didn't want to put it all on a credit card, obviously. So we put in as much as we could, use the rest. We use a credit card, hired a contractor, made a mistake there. I hired a guy that I, I liked him personally. He seemed like a cool guy that I could have beers with, but that's not how you hire contractors. I don't hire anybody, frankly, but I just didn't know any better. So I'm like, I'm going to hire somebody who I kind of get along with and I like so, it. Wait, wait, wait. So you don't hire people because you like to drink with them? <laughs> You don't hire them because you like to drink. Okay, with them. all right, all right. I just don't make sure. you like drinking with them. Hey, Maybe that's, that's different, but uh, but that's a <laughs> okay. bonus. That's I a bonus. You. All right, good. Okay. Um, but he, you know, he he seemed like a good guy. He had a military background, which whether or not you think that means anything or not, I thought maybe yeah. it meant something. Maybe you know, a little bit more work ethic, honesty. Turns out, it didn't mean much. Um, 
he did the work. He finally finished, but he didn't pay his subcontractor. So for anybody out there who ever hired a contractor, he was a general contractor. He hired electricians. He hired plumbers. He hired drywall guys. And he paid most of them, but he didn't pay the electrician. So what do I get on? What happens to me when he kind of you know leaves and I can't get a hold of him again? I get a note in the mail that there's a lien against my property yeah. from an electrician that I thought I paid because I wrote the check and gave it to my general contractor. Um, but I talked to, talk to him and they're like, yeah, he didn't pay us. And we only have one recourse and that's to put a lien on your house. We believe you paid him, but that's irrelevant because we yeah. don't have the money. So I ended up having- Hold on, just for clarity for the listeners yeah. and viewers. So when Mike paid the general contractor and the, the subcontractor didn't get paid, that subcontractor could put a mechanics lien on the property yeah. Yep. And it's still Mike's responsibility, even though he paid his bill. Yep. Right. Yep. Like, so I just want to make sure that that was clear for the listeners. And yeah. And just for their sake, too, if anyone's asking, how do I avoid that? Which is a key question. Um, there's there's a document called a release of lien that you should have all of the subcontractors sign prior to the job being completed. So they they sign off that they received payment. And so they can, you know, the, the, the electrician or the plumber or whatever won't technically be able to come back and put a mechanics lien on your property because they've acknowledged that they got paid. I didn't know that. I didn't do that, obviously. So that's a learning and, opportunity, right? It's a learning opportunity. And, I, and you know what? It helped me help me sharpen my negotiating skills because I learned how to negotiate with an electrician who never got paid. And they were nice enough to cut the bill in half for me because they recognized that I was sort of new. And I, I, assu I assume they thought I just seemed honest. So uh, they cut the bill in half, which was great, but still learning experience. Um, but that house ended up costing 15 grand to renovate. We sold it for, I think, 75 and we ended up making about 15 grand after all was said and done, paying back loans and, you know, holding costs and all this stuff that we had to deal with. Um, we made about $15,000. And for me, that was a small lottery winnings. Like yeah. we were, we were blown away. That was a fortune. It was a fortune. And, and more importantly, uh, my, like I said, I may be a crazy risk taker, but my wife who was, who was partnering with me in this, in this endeavor, endeavor, she's not. A super risk taker. She's very conservative. She's very careful with how we spend and what we do. And it's good. It's good to have that checks and balances, right? In all aspects. But she was uh, cautiously optimistic. She was hopeful. But once we got that that check for $15,000 from the title company, she was like, what are you doing standing there? Get out there and let's do another She's one. Like, I'm all in. <laughs> yeah. And then and then she was good because she she pushed. And and it wasn't that I needed pushing, but you know, listen, from time to time, I compartmentalize. There's times when I want downtime and I'm just relaxing. And she was always good for going, listen, you know, you have how many houses did you make offers on today? And she sort of pushed me like that, which was great because I, I started realizing it's a system. Everything, everything is about systematizing, creating a process if you want predictable outcomes. And I wanted a pre predictable outcome, but I would like flurry of offers and then I wouldn't make any offers. And then I would get a deal and I'd stop making offers and stop looking for deals. But it's like, that's how you create peaks and valleys is on the peak, that's when you need to be looking for the next opportunity, whatever that is, right? So that you don't have those deep valleys. So I had these crazy peaks and valleys and, and we went like that for a couple of years. I was working full time still at the time. Okay, so um, peaks and valleys uh, for the first couple of years? Yeah, for the okay. first, probably four or five years there were peaks and valleys for me okay and that was because you would stop basically looking for deals i would stop looking for deals and i would take too long to renovate houses because i wasn't i had no system i had no process so when i got, got to be on a contract and i and i had to renovate it i would go out and i would interview contractors all over again yeah. i would i would pick out materials as if i had never done it in my life and it was all like this reinventing every single time and i didn't have that systemized way of doing things and i had no team it was and by that time by the way i can tell the story if you want but uh between 2008 and let's just say 2013 th 2014 my wife sort of backed out of the business of the real okay. of the flipping business um just wasn't for her it just doesn't suit her mentality she doesn't like peaks and valleys she doesn't like uncertainty she doesn't like contractors getting a little like all that stuff like it just wasn't for her all the stress so she just said Listen, I trust you. I believe in you. You're going to be wildly successful. You don't need me. I'm going to back out and I'm going to be a supportive person for you. And I'm just, you go for it and do what you got to do. But I need to be out of the day to day. It's too stressful, too much, you know, too much stress for me. So, okay. All right. And so, what year in this time period was the year that you went from zero to, to a million? I went from zero to a million uh, in 2016. Okay. So tell us about that. So yep. now we're in 2016. So at this point, before we get into 2016, yep. you've done a fair amount of deals, correct? Yeah. I, I got to the point where I was doing a couple of deals a month. 
a couple deals. So maybe 20, 24 deals a year, yeah. something in that yeah. ballpark. Yeah, exactly. Did you have your systems down by then? No. Okay. I didn't. I, didn't. Okay. I, I, okay. I was better. I was better, but I, I certainly had no real good process. That's for okay. Sure. All right. So then what happened in 2016? So in it, so 2016 is what happened. Toward the end of 2015, uh, I met a guy uh, through my podcast, frankly, and and he was flipping houses in California, and he was doing a hundred a year. You know, which you hear that number and you yeah. go, "Yes, he's not doing a hundred a year." <laughs> Turns out, I became friends with him, flew out there, saw his operation, like talked to, like he was legitimately doing a hundred deals a year. And and he started a, a mastermind. He said, "Hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna." pull in high achieving investors from around the country and we're going to form this mastermind. Do you want to be part of it? We're going to exchange ideas and try to help raise all boats, right? Raise the level of the water, raise all boats. And I said, sure. And prior to this, and this is super key guys for, I don't care what industry and really doesn't matter. I was in a super small bubble in my little Southeast Michigan part of the world. So for me, the most volume I had ever seen anybody do in real estate was like what I was doing. I had nobody who had done anything more than me at that point to really look at and go, wow, that's somebody who's really, and, and sort of expand my horizons. Now, I will say when I went to college uh, in my as an adult, that really helped open up my mind to possibilities. Same thing when I joined this mastermind. I started sitting in a room a couple times a year and toward the end of 2015, early 16, I sat in a room with a guy who had the business that I wanted, but he was four years down the road. In other words, four years earlier, he was running the same business that I had at the time. So you could see within a relative short period of, within within shot, you could yep. get there. Like four years yeah. is a long time, but not, that's four within Four years grasp. is a long time. Yeah. But when you can use somebody else's foresight, yeah. I'm sorry, somebody else's hindsight is your foresight, that's powerful, right? Okay. So I just sat him down and said, listen, you you were me four years ago and now you're where I want to be. What did you do? Like, and I just started deconstructing and he was super gracious and giving. He's like, I'll tell you exactly what I did. And not only that, I'll tell you what I did wrong. So you can avoid some of those mistakes. And once he kind of went, and we, we spent hours and we spent this over the course of a few different days, but hours. And at the end, I'm like, his name's Andy McFarlane. I said, Andy, if you if you did this in four years and you just told you gave me the roadmap and you even told me what you did wrong and you sort of figured it out organically, why couldn't I compress this into a year and do the exact same thing? I have the playbook and I know yeah. what you did. And he's like, there, there's really no reason you can't. And yeah. so that was my that was my objective. And then we had a friendly little wager inside of that mastermind amongst all these high achieving real estate investors that whoever got to a million dollars in, in gross profits first would get a free trip to Hawaii. We would all pay for them to go to Hawaii. And so I told my wife about it. Well, at a million, million bucks, do you really need the free trip though? No, no. <laughs> Here's the thing. Here's the crazy thing. If you find someone who, who's who's wildly financially successful and they're competitive and you give them something to go for, it could be a stupid you know, uh, yeah. award. Competitive people want to win something and I yeah. wanted to win something. And I called my wife. I was in California at the time at the meetup. And I'm I said, Hey, this is the deal. This is the the um this is the bet, right? Basically, we're making. She's like, Oh, you get that. Cause I want to go to, I want to go to we're in Michigan, remember, right? So we're not that close to Hawaii. It's a little bit more of a trek for us. So we'd been there before, we loved it. And she's like, You go. So long story short, I did that. I, I got that. Now so that's like the you know the six year overnight or seven year overnight success story. It took me a long time and a lot of learning. And along the way, I didn't have systems, didn't have processes. And we could talk about specifically what I did to get to a million from doing just a few deals, which a few deals for me was like a couple hundred thousand, you know, run rate. That's basically what I was on pace to do before okay. I, I made some transformations. Um, what was what was the key transformation? Like, give give me one specific thing yeah. that was between a few hundred and a million. Okay. Th there was more than one, obviously okay. more than one thing, but I'll, I'll give you one that I think that I may not have gotten over this hurdle without having advice and having someone to talk to. And that's hiring, building a team. Right. And, and I don't necessarily mean hiring, you know, W2 full salary. Like I'm not necessarily talking about that. I'm talking about building a team. For me, I was in this vicious catch 22 and a lot of people in my market are still in this friends of mine who I try to talk to and they're like, Oh, they won't listen. But I was in this vicious catch 22 of I, I need to be a bigger company with more revenue before I can hire, but I can't become a big enough company with more revenue yeah. unless I get help, right? Catch 22, so, right? Catch 22, classic catch 22. And I was in that mindset, like I can't hire because I don't have enough 
revenue cash flow to pay for somebody. And, and it was through talking to folks who were running bigger businesses than me, frankly, Andy and other people who said, no, you have to hire, you, you have to start building the company that you want if you ever want it to be that company. And I learned strategic and, and very creative ways of bringing people onto my team without necessarily having the full burden of a salary. And I'll tell you how I did that. Probably the key hire that I made that really helped me really take off uh, and like ho hockey stick um, growth. And I, I learned recently when I said this on another show, not everyone knows what hockey stick growth means. I had to explain that to you. I've never explained it. Exponential, right? Yeah, the graph goes and it goes up. Um, but I did that uh, by hiring a salesperson. So for me- So commission-based commission salesperson? Well, let me get there because okay. here's, here's right. my limiting belief. I can't afford a salesperson. I certainly can't afford a great salesperson. So okay. for me, I was going out on appointments and I, th I knew that I wasn't the best salesman, but I thought I was decent, you know, like pretty good. And what you find when you run a company is- You already know. 87% of all real estate agents fail in this business. And you also know it doesn't have to be that way. If you're a real estate agent and you're looking for consistent and predictable income, I invite for you to get your free copy of Real Estate Evolution, the 10 step guide to CPI, consistent and predictable income for real estate agents. And you can do so when you visit www.the realestateevolution.com. I'll share with you your book that I authored to show you the way. And it's free. You just have to pay for the shipping. Thanks. As the owner, you can force yourself to be decent at most things because you're right. so incentivized. It's your company, it's your life, it's your livelihood. But I thought it was decent. Well, then I got a, a call out of the blue from someone who's like, hey, I found you online. I'm, I want to get into real estate. Can I pick your brain? Uh, and I usually don't do that because I, I get those offers. I'm sure you do too. I can't, I can't accommodate all of them. It would just, I, I would never get anything done. So for whatever reason, once in a while, I do say yes. So if you want to have coffee with me, keep trying and eventually I'll say yes, I guess. But beat him uh, down, beat him down. I know. <laughs> beat me down. So I said yes, and I'm not going to make this long, but it's important. It's an important story. I, I, he, he took me out for coffee. We had coffee. He, he seemed great. He seemed smart. He was a salesperson. He was a pharmaceutical salesperson. Nothing to do with real estate, but he wanted to get into real estate. We had this conversation. It was great. We connected. He was a good guy, young guy, very active and very, very proactive. After it was over, he sent me an email and he summarized our conversation and he gave me a list of ways that he thought he could specifically help me. And oh, he wow. offered to work for me as a salesperson for free. Now, I don't like doing things that feel unethical or a little bit borderline. So I said, you know what? I wasn't ready to hire a salesperson yet. I was probably three to five months away in my head. I was totally ready. But in my head back sure. then, I was, I was still months off. But I said, you seem really like on top of it, a great salesperson. He had told me that in his company, he was the regional, the top regional salesperson. Like they were giving him awards. They love this guy. And I said, I'll hire you, but I, I will pay you commission. I can't hire you and let you do it for free. I don't, I don't feel comfortable with that, but I'll pay you commission. And he's like, fine, I, I'm on the road all day locally. I can just absolutely just crush my sales job. And I still have hours of my day left over because I'm just good at it. And I'm like, okay, great. So I started sending my phone calls to him and he started taking calls with a little bit of coaching for me. And then he would go on the appointments and get the contract. And I realized when I saw him working, given the same amount of leads as I would have taken in a given week, he was double and triple my production or what I was able to accomplish. If he had five appointments, he'd get a contract two or three times. I would get a contract once. That was, that was my that was my pace. And I was like, wow, I, I had no idea. So it, it dawned on me, bringing someone on your team, especially the right people in a creative strategic commission way, right? It doesn't necessarily cost me anything if we're not producing, but when they start producing at a two to three times, two, three X what you can do, now the revenue starts opening. Now you can bring in that admin in. You can bring someone to help you out with some of your other kind of lower level tasks or administrative stuff. And I'm really big into pro, uh, profile, personality profile, testing, right? The Colby, the disc, whatever it is that you use. Um, and, and I learned what I learned about myself was I'm not a detail person. If you ask me to look over a document as the final check before it goes off, you will be in trouble because I will miss things all the time. I'm not a detail person. So my next hire was a detail person. I brought someone in who could take a lot of the details off my plate. And for me, that was a lot of title stuff, 
dealing with yeah. title, getting title work done, getting all the paperwork from buyers and sellers and all this stuff that kind of bogs us down. I brought someone in to handle that stuff for me. And now I'm, I have a lot more free time. I have a lot more time to look down the road at the horizon. And now I'm steering the ship instead of like, you know, scooping buckets of water out of a sinking ship because I'm, I'm overwhelmed. So now I'm starting to build my team. And I just building that team and creating a team that is incentivized is is key to grow. You, I could never have gotten to a million dollars on my own. I just couldn't have. There was too many components, too many plates that had to be in the air. I would have dropped some. So that was, if you asked me for one key, that was one key thing. But two of the other things that I would say are absolutely right behind it in terms of must do to grow your business from any scale to whatever it is you want to be, you want to do is we talked about it earlier a little bit. Systems and processes. You have to have a repeatable teachable, downloadable, something you can share and with your team and, and show them how to do in terms of process and systems. But right hand in hand with that, that goes right with it and you should not ignore it. And this is probably, if you ask me why businesses go out of business or lose money, I'll tell you, it's not necessarily they didn't hire properly. It's not even necessarily they don't have a process and systems. It's they don't track their numbers. And I learned how to track my numbers. I learned how to check how much money am I spending in marketing? How many calls is that generating? How many good leads out of those calls am I getting? How many appointments is that giving me? How many contracts do I get for every appointment? Or how many appointments does it take to get me one contract? And what is a contract worth to me? Just basic numbers like that. I wasn't tracking it. So most people, they know, and I'm sure you, you've seen this a million times, Absolutely. money's coming in, money's going out, money's coming. It feels like, hey, well, I've, I've been there. <laughs> hey man, it's churning, right? Yeah. But I, I equate that to like, if you're in an airplane, you, you can get that plane off the ground and you could be flying and you know you're in the air. So you turn off all the controls, you close your eyes and lean back because you're in the air. What else do you have to know? You're in the air. Well, there's a mountain maybe ahead of you. There could be a building ahead, like whatever it is. You don't know what's happening in your business just because money's going in and, and coming out, right? That's just churn. That doesn't mean anything. Is there more money going out than coming in? In a lot of cases, yes. And, and a lot of times people are so afraid to track numbers and they're so resistant to it that they just put their head in the sand and they just hope for the best until they hit a building or hit a, hit a mountain or crash because they're losing altitude. Okay. And they don't even know it. All right. So hiring and hiring the right people specifically. Yep. Systems and then keeping track of your numbers. Those would be the top three that you would Those suggest. Those would be the top three in Got my it. book, which covers all of these things. There's tell, I, yeah. Tell me, Mike. So you wrote a book recently. So what's yep. the title of your book? The book is called, since we're video here, the book is called Level Jumping. Got and it. How I grew my business to, uh, from, like I said, I was a couple hundred thousand dollars to over a million dollars in less than 12 months. And, and those three things are heavily covered in the book. But we also cover things like, here's the deal. When I, I'm from the automotive world, right? I worked there for a while. And here's what I saw in the automotive world. And this is repeated in all industries. But let's just use this example. I, I was in the automotive industry. And what they would frequently do in the automotive, the execs, the higher ups, the people with all the knowledge, right? They would go into, for example, the engineering department. And they would locate and identify the best engineer that we have in that department, the best. And what would they do to that poor soul, whether it be a guy or girl, whatever, they would elevate them to the engineering manager. Now they're not engineering anymore. They're managing and leading and inspiring and training engineers and not all great engineers. I would dare say engineers, most of them yeah. are not good yeah. managers. They're yeah. good engineers. So for us, as people who start a company and we're kind of grinding it away in, in, in the trenches, we become good technicians, right? The E-Myth taught us about the different types of people, right? You learn to be a good technician. You learn how to take calls and create rapport. You learn how to go on appointments and create rapport with that seller. You learn how to, how to flip or whatever you're doing. You learn all the mechanics of that. And then I, the guy like me comes along and says, oh, did you want to grow this to a million or more? And you say, yes, I want to grow this to a million or more. And I go, okay, great. Now you need to hire yourself out of the day-to-day, -day, out of the trenches, and you need to lead, hire, lead, inspire, train, motivate. That's your job now. And that's and not they motivate and get out of the way and hold them accountable for the success. 100%. But, Engage them. Bring energy in. Yeah, 100%. But people don't realize that that's the skill now they have to hone. Just like answering calls, doing marketing, talking to sellers, you have to, you have to sharpen those skills when you're in the trenches. Now you have to learn how to do all the things that we just said, right? And that's not intuitive for people. And how do they do that? So I talked about hiring a team, right? Here's what I didn't tell you. I started hiring a team 2016. I put my team together. We got to a million dollars. 2017, 
We also got to a million dollars. We didn't get past that because my team started fracturing because I didn't necessarily bring in people that were the right fit. I brought in warm bodies who seemed to have a good resume. And so the people that I hired in 2016, most of them were gone by the end of 2017 because I hired purely for ability, purely for the resume. I didn't know how to like hire properly. So my book covers in, in great detail how to hire responsibly, effectively for long term. So I had to kind of clean house because my team started falling apart, right? Bad fit. So 2017 was a very similar profit year. So we had those bumps in the road along the way. So I talk about culture. Like it's a tough thing to talk about when you're a one man band. You have one, you know, you're just you. I get it. But it's culture, whether you're a team of two, three, or 10 or, or more. The company's culture is the company's personality, right? Let me you may you, say, uh, Dan, if yeah. I say, hey, Dan, what is, if, if I say to you real quick, what is your personality? And you go, oh, oh, I'm a nice guy. I don't really think about it. Well, as a company, if you don't think about your personality, it's probably not a good one, right? Yeah. A personality, a company culture is something you consciously have to cultivate so that people want to be there. I've worked at companies where I like getting up in the morning and going in. It was fun. I enjoyed the people I worked with. And I had companies where it felt like I was going to a library, meets a morgue, meets a prison. Like I just hated it. It was awful. Yeah. I define culture as the way that we treat each other. Yep. And that could be good, that could be bad. Yet when you look at it from an organizational structure, hopefully it's good. And when you can define that culture, because you're gonna treat people somewhere or another, there's gonna be a way that your company treats each other. Yeah. So you might as well define it so that it serves each other rather than just, it is gonna be just whatever it's gonna be. Yep. And maybe just as importantly, it's how you treat each other in the company. That defines your company culture internally, but you have an external presence that you project, right? To partners and other people you deal with, title companies, whatever it is, you may not have a great external personality. So that's something to pay attention to because listen, our industry, it's a people industry, right? Absolutely. It's not just your people, it's all people. You you need to project the personality, the culture and the image that you want your company to have for, for, the, for the success of everybody. And I found, by the way, as I'm hiring, I don't hire, everyone I hire is not my age. So everyone I hire doesn't have like my cultural experience or whatever. So you have to learn what is important to the folks that you're hiring, whether they're millennials and millennials get beat up a little bit by guys my age in terms of like, oh, they're lazy, oh, whatever. They're not. They just have a different perspective on life. And you have to understand what it is. You can fight it. You can grumble about it. You can go home and complain about it, whatever you need to do. But realize the people that you hire have specific things, triggers, motivation, that makes them want to come into work. And guess what? Here's a tip. It's not always money. My generation who grew up in the eighties, primarily, we were motivated probably more by money than anything else. We didn't expect autonomy. We didn't expect to be necessarily treated nice. We just want pay us and then give us a raise and give us a raise. And I've, I've done that. I've thrown money at people that I thought were good people and they didn't seem to like have the right motivation or the right attitude. Now, I would just pay them more and it never, never worked. It wasn't what they needed. Some people just need to be recognized. So you like, know? so, yeah, so you're, you're speaking soon. You're speaking in October. Is that right? I am speaking in October about it. Tell, tell me about that. Yeah. So thank you. I appreciate that. It's called Flip Hacking Live. Uh, it's a it's a it's a conference. It's a, a, a three day event that happens once a year. This year, it's going to be on October 15th, 16th and 17th. It is virtual for obvious reasons. It was going to be in person. It's always in person. This year, it's going to be virtual, but it's going to be amazing. A lot of investors, realtors, different people from around the country, highly successful, getting on stage, virtual stage, and just sharing what works for them and what they're doing in their business and how they're making it work and how they're being successful specifically in the time we're living. So uh, if anyone is interested in doing that, if you don't mind, uh, you can go to uh, bestrealestateevent.com. Dot com. So best oh, I love that. I love that name. <laughs> yeah. And you can go there and you can check it out and you can buy tickets. Tickets are only 297. It's like nothing. Three days packed with with just giving and just tons of content. And you get a swag box if you if you if you uh, buy a ticket. So there's free stuff. There's there's a lot of uh, good content and it's 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 so cheap. It's like nothing basically. Got it. How do we get your how do we get your book? You can get my book one of two ways. If you want to go to Amazon and look for level jumping, you can totally do that and I'll appreciate it. And I'm going to look at my number here. Or, or for your audience, if you if they're interested, if they want to get a digital download for free, they can uh, text the words, now two words, just start. So text two words, just start to the number 55444. So that's just start to the number 55444. And I will send you a free digital download of the book. Okay, so that's just space yes. start. 
Correct. Five, five, four, four, four. And we'll put all that in the notes of the show. And Mike, what's one nut little nugget you can leave us with of, of worst advice? If you were talking to Mikey instead yeah. of Mike Simmons, Mikey Simmons. Yeah. Right. It's, instead of your dad saying, Hey, suck it up buttercup. Right. What would you say to Mikey? What I would Starting say to him is, yeah. What I would say to him is here's the thing. So just start as an my podcast. That's why that's the worst. My book. I was, I am, I would be very motivated by someone explaining and maybe showing me a little bit of the regret that I have of not starting younger, right? There's the worst thing, Gary Vaynerchuk talks about this all the time. The one of the worst things that can happen to a person is they have regret. Regret hurts and there's nothing you can do about it, really. It's already done, right? So if it were me, I'd say, dude, when you're 49 and you're you're talking to Dan, What's, you know, you're going to tell him the one thing you wish you would have done was started sooner. Just get started. What you're afraid of, of, of starting, whatever it is that makes you afraid, whether it's being ridiculed, failure, losing money, whatever it is, whatever you're afraid of, I guarantee you it's not nearly as bad as you're building it up to in your head. And I built it big in my head of all the things to be afraid of until I finally did it. And I made mistakes and I made $15,000 on my first deal and I never wow. looked back. So fantastic. Go. Michael, thank you so much. And, um, Look forward to staying in touch with you and supporting you in every way that we can. Thank Listeners, you. viewers, please go to those websites and um, text Mike as well, and we'll put all those notes into the show. Thank oh. you. Thanks, man. Give us a thumbs up by clicking the like button below. Don't forget to subscribe to.